It's eight o'clock and this is Doing Democracy with Marion Green, Commissioner of Hennepin County in Minnesota. That's to be separate from thinking that this is a city position with Minneapolis. As she pointed out to me, Hennepin County has several large cities in it, Minneapolis just being one of the cities in the county. My name is Joe Rittman, and I've been invited to be the interviewer for this group, and I'm going to do my best. And here you see a picture of me. And in this picture, actually, you'll see that I am teaching her brother, Thomas Green. And this was in 1974. And that's when Marion was in the class below or in kindergarten. And that's the next picture. So. This is going to be the point at which I'm going to remind you to mute yourself or we will going to be muting you for you because for the next periods of time, we hope to hear from Marion and less from me. But if you have something to say, please think about typing it into the chat. I will be monitoring it and everyone else is gonna be monitoring it so we can all see what you're thinking about. So if you have ideas and questions that you want Marion to comment on or think about, please don't be shy to put something into the chat bar on your right. Okay. So, so she's right there in the front row. Oh, cute. Blonded, blonde hair, and we see her in the name. There she is. This is 1974, five, and she is officially a member of the class of 19. 87. 87. So what we want to do is ask Marion how she ties her life 35 years back to this very picture with all of these students in Cody. Well, um, first of all, just thank you, Joe, for taking on the role of interviewer. I think that's a tough one. And thanks to the whole Cody team who's helped pull this together. It, I, I just relish my Cody connection. Uh, obviously, you've heard that it started in, you know, what was called first grade, but actually ended up being kindergarten for me. Uh, but it's one of those things that's just given me joy all my life. And now here in Minnesota, I'm so glad there's an active alumni network. It really uh, gives me so much pleasure. It reminds me of a part of my life that feels far away sometimes. So I just wanna thank the whole Cody community. Really grateful for that. So Joe, your question was sort of, how did we get from there to here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Anything you well, wanna tell um, us about your nurtured, nurturing experience from Cody, how you went were a, a sprout from the Cody <laughs> hard rock to the fertile grounds of Minnesota. Anything you want to tell us about that long 33 year journey? Well, I think one of the gifts of Cody, I think for my whole family was that, um, that it was really a values based education. And that was sort of a thread that connects Cody in my mind to other educational experiences I had subsequent to those years. Uh, and ultimately to my high school, which was also a a, um, a school, a high school affiliated with a, a Christian tradition, uh, and and now in my work that's really focused on um, trying to make the world a better place, which I think is um, at the heart of those values that sort of began um, in the Cody setting. Before we get too far, I thought um, it might be amusing if I, oops, I was going to share my screen to share a few pictures of myself at that time and actually of my sister and brother who were um, the class of 83 and the class of uh, 79 respectively, um, because I thought maybe some folks on this call would recognize them. This first picture is me and my siblings with my grandfather. The picture was taken in the US, but it shows us at the right era. And I thought that might be good for jogging memories. So this is my sister and brother and I with my grandfather um, and my sister and brother and I, this is, I mean, this is the era that we were uh, of the time that we lived in, in India. So um, there's my sister, Meg Green. She was class of 79 at Cody. Uh, my brother on the right um, went by Tommy at the time and now he's Tom Green, class of 83. And then myself in the middle, um, class of 87. In case that sort of jogs any memories for those of you on the phone, uh, I think it, it's the plaid slacks and the bobby socks. 
<laughs> that we remember. Go That's ahead. Um, so then let's go down to the next picture. Um, this is around also that same era, me and my brother Tom on the ah. beach uh, in Chennai. My parents were in Chennai for three years, and, and then the last year we spent uh, a good chunk of the time up, up in Cody. Um, here's another Chennai picture, my, me and my dad on an elephant. Uh, here's me and my brother uh, in our backyard in Chennai. I thought this picture also might jog some memories if any of you happen to know my brother. And then this is, here's the one picture that I know was actually taken in Cody um, at Jaffna House that I think a number of you have associations with. Ah, <laughs> I've been in that shower place, I know that. <laughs> Uh, in any event, so it all it all started in Cody, and um, one of the things uh, uh, that I like to share about that my experiences at Cody was this enormous sense of community. Um, and one of my favorite memories of that time um, was field day, and sort of the whole school descending on the field and playing sports together and competing, but also being in fellowship and in community. Uh, and eating that big curry meal that I remember um, being uh, served off the back end of a truck onto, onto everybody's banana leaf. Um, as you sat at cross-legged around the field, everybody had their banana leaf with rice, with curry, um, and just memories like that are so um, such a delight and, and I think were some of the experiences that formed me who, into who I am today. So uh, from I was in one of those families, a foreign service family, where we moved every handful of years. Um, so we went from India to Morocco, Brazil, Pakistan, and then back to the U.S. Um, and I finished high school in the U.S. and went to college also in the U.S. Uh, and uh, was immediately interested in the public policy side of work. I had actually majored in biology, but I was intrigued by science and policy. Uh, and fast forward a few years, I had an MBA under my belt, um, was working in the medical device industry, sort of using this, both the science and the policy, uh, and a position came open to run for the legislature. So I was in the Minnesota State Legislature, uh, what got redistributed out shortly thereafter, and as, as lines were redrawn after the census. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we can skip a few bumps in there, uh, but my county commissioner resigned and I decided to run for the open seat. And I have to tell you, I think county government is actually sort of where it's at. Uh, so I look forward to perhaps convincing some of you that um, county governments make great employers, whether or not you run for office or you are looking for a job. Um, there's a lot of dynamic work happening in local government. Thank you. Okay, cool. So that we thought of it would be so much more interesting if you had picked up on your biology and you could have talked about all the crazy animals that scared you to death in Cody. But now that you're working in the county, can you tell us a little bit about what that's about? Because um, as I said in my intro, I think most of us are thinking about the city. Very few of us actually think about the county in 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 St. Paul here, I noticed that the county roads are always kept clean. The city roads are always horrible. So there is a difference. And I know that I pay my property taxes to the county. Um, I get a rebate from the state. The city isn't in the picture. They take our money by the sale. So all these little differences are probably not familiar to everybody. But if you could just tell us a little bit about how this exciting county government thing um, sort of make sense within Hennepin County and Minneapolis Twin Cities. Yes, absolutely. And, and of course, to make it more confusing, by the way, county government varies state by state. <laughs> but the US is split it up about half and half into states where county government is extremely powerful and of the other half of states, county government is less powerful. And one of the reasons that um, it's more powerful in Minnesota and why we have a really important role in the sort of functioning of the community is that we're the safety net. We are the layer of government through, through which a big number of federal and state dollars go. Um, and we spend them in order to support our community, um, people who are experiencing homelessness, people who may be jobless, um, people who for whatever reason need to sort of engage with government to be a safety net. Hennepin County 
uh, and counties in general in Minnesota are that safety net. Um, and Joe, as you alluded to, we have a number of other lines of work as well. Uh, we also have um, roads and bridges. So we are, um, we're sort of a deep pockets organization. If something expensive is needed to be built and that has a regional function, county government often plays a role. Um, we are also the, in Hennepin County, uh, the steward of our library system. So the Hennepin County library system uh, reaches across the county. We also have a public safety function. So uh, part of county government is the county sheriff's office and the county attorney's office. And those are both, uh, they serve Hennepin County as a whole. Um, and perhaps it would be helpful if I backed up and gave you a little bit of a snapshot of Hennepin County. Uh, Hennepin County is about one and a half million people. Um, we are considered a large urban county we're the 32nd largest or most populated county in the United States. Um, Minneapolis, as Joe alluded to, is our biggest city. Uh, Minneapolis is about a quarter to a third of our population lives in the city of Minneapolis. Um, and Hennepin County itself is about a, a quarter of the population of Minnesota. So I always like to say that as goes Hennepin County, so goes Minnesota. But it's also true that as goes Minneapolis, so goes Hennepin County. <laughs> and if, if you were to ask me, um, uh, we, we, are, we are involved in so many different uh, parts of work in the community. We also do um, have a lot to do with trash disposal and recycling, for example. If you were to ask me about sort of any given topic, you know, Marion, or is Hennepin County involved in X? The answer is almost undoubtedly yes, um, but it might vary as to exactly how. So before we go a little bit deeper to this, I want to recognize that we are a, a international transcontinental Zoom tonight. Um, someone from my class is here from France. I saw another person from Australia. Um, of course, you have this contingent from India. Um, so it's kind of cool. We And then of course, all across the state, but we don't consider the US a continent to be counted. It's just part of North America. Um, I wanted to ask you exactly, you know, where does all of the waste from the city go? Does that go into their own dump or does that go into a county dump? And how do you kind of like deal with this as we are addressing, taking care of the environment in a big way? I mean, we, we are a city, um, which is basically a blight on the environment. We, we use a lot of energy and carbon. We mm -hmm. end up destroying trees. We do all kinds of nasty things. So what is Hennepin County, and you're the sort of head factor in the, in the county, how do you lead the charge to make it green and make it happy for the universe? Um, Joe, that's such a great question, and I, I do want to say up front that while cities are a blight on the environment, suburbs are actually more of a blight on the environment because people are more spread out. The beauty of cities is at least that all of us are sort of stacked on top of each other using services efficiently, you know, the sewer pipe doesn't have to go as far in a city to reach, you know, 100 um, users or clients. So. I do want to say that if you are, you know, looking to make a geographic move based on your environmental beliefs, you should move to a city. <laughs> um, and so the role of the county, um, I'll, I'll sort of go from trash to sort of the ambitions of climate change or, or addressing climate change. We have a big role in, in trash and the disposal of trash. This, the Minneapolis city trash is, uh, oh, terrific. Somebody's put up a map maybe, anyway. Uh, the the um, trash in the city of Minneapolis almost entirely goes to a garbage burner. So here in Hennepin County, we do um, what's called waste to energy. We take that waste and we burn it. And then a good chunk of Minneapolis city's energy is generated from, from that waste. Uh, this is something that's more popular in Europe than it is in the United States, but it's something that Hennepin County has been doing since the 1980s. Um, for trash that's from our suburban, the suburban parts of the county, that trash is mostly going to landfills. Um, and with all of our trash, we're working very hard to get people to reduce, to recycle, to reuse, uh, to really cut down on the amount of trash generated. 
Um, and we do that in a number of different ways. Um, we're in, we've worked with our city partners to incent them to embrace um, uh, organics and, and composting on a sort of citywide scale. So for example, I do live in the city of Minneapolis and here we have curbside pickup for our organic waste. So my husband and I have a little bucket that we keep in the kitchen and that's where anything that's organic goes or compostable. So it is some paper products um, as well as all of our food waste. And we tie that up into a little compostable bag and take it out to the curbside just as we do with our regular trash, um, but it's picked up separately and it goes to a commercial composting location. And we have, um, as I alluded to, relationships with the cities where we're pushing them to offer this. So right now, some of our more um, ambitious cities, they have curbside pickup as I described, or they might have uh, um, regional pickup in the city. So they might have a drop-off location essentially in the city where it, multiple drop-off locations where you can take waste. Um, and then other cities honestly have, have sort of chosen not to accept some of our supplemental funding and they don't offer that service, but we're constantly trying to sort of make it a sweeter deal for the cities that make up our, um, our sort of trash responsibility. Um, we also, uh, on sort of the climb, on the topic of environmentalism and, and climate change, we see ourselves as an important player, both because we as an organization are an employer of 9,000 people and we ourselves are using energy and we need to sort of get our own house in order, uh, but also as a leader and a convener. Um, so we're right now actually uh, writing our climate action plan that we're hoping is going to, I'm hoping as a policymaker, will include a balance of uh, things that we need to do internally, you know, make sure that all of our lights are on motion sensors, you know, things that are very sort of um, hands on like that, but also has some bigger loftier goals as regards our partnerships and our role in the community. You know, I think one of the difficult challenges of the topic of climate change is that it's very diffuse. Um, the, the, the sort of responsibility for whose fault it is is very widespread um, and its impacts feel distant. And so all of us are sort of waiting for somebody else to do something big. But what I see is that Hennepin County has a, a, the, the, um, the opportunity to sort of go first and lead by example. And I really want to see us maximizing that role. It sounds like, you know, you, you have a good chance of, of being a leader. And Manjusha just asked about whether, how do you incentivize people? In, in St. Paul, we don't really worry about incentivizing. We just have a law that says this is how it's going to be. And we have a contract. The city has a contract with the garbage collectors. And this is how it goes. So it's more like, how do you... Uh, how do you enforce what people are supposed to be doing? So let's go to kind of the, the opposite side of this question from what do you do now about people who, because of the COVID situation where you have people who are moving around, who refuse to follow the rules, the public health responsibility, uh, the public health rules that Hennepin County is talking about, wearing masks, closing down, uh, businesses and other kinds of uh, activities. How do you deal with the fact that you have a population which, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, I think I checked it out, but it's like 60 or 70% of Minnesotans wear masks. That means there's 40% of the population who simply don't even want to do that simple thing. How do you deal with that when you're trying to get people to line up and do uh, smart things? Well, um, you bring up a really, you know, one of maybe the toughest questions that we have, which is this balance of sort of using enforcement versus using, um, it, trying to sort of more gently change cultural norms and sort of a more public health approach. Uh, I'm noticing, by the way, that somebody asked in the, in the chat about um, how do we, you know, sort of a permutation of that is how do we get people to be less interested in consuming? <laughs> and more interested in reusing or reducing. Um, and one of the things that we did do on the, on the, um, on the trash side was we worked with, uh, we recruited families uh, across Hennepin County who sort of lived in all different types of settings um, and asked them to be a zero waste family for, um, I think it was two, a two month period. 
And we worked with them on sort of how to do this uh, and learned a lot about consumer behavior, but also I think they learned a lot. And then we partnered with different um, newspapers and uh, news outlets and made it into a news story that could be sort of consumed. And their examples essentially sort of demonstrated to others that this can be done. <laughs> Uh, and that was a way of, of sort of popularizing some of the ideas that they were generating in individual households. Um, but it can be it can be really difficult. And on the topic of COVID, um, we uh, are also a public health uh, uh, public health entity in the state of Minnesota. That's one of the many lines of our work that I didn't mention earlier. Uh, and one of the things that we've done is. Uh, tried to take a, um, an approach of, uh, as we communicate about COVID and the need for people to wear masks and really the need for people not to socialize and not to congregate, we've tried to take a, an approach that's about taking care. So rather than, you know, you must always wear masks, we have taken approach of like, well, don't, don't you love one another? Don't you love your family members? Well, as if you love your family, you're gonna wanna stay away from um, crowded settings, for example. So the, the campaign has been called Take Care Hennepin County. And the idea is, you know, take care of blank. And you can fill that in with, you know, the name or description of a family member whom you love and want to look after, and you're going to make um, good public health choices in order to safeguard their well-being. Uh, so that's an, an, an example of an angle that we've chosen to take that feels a little bit different than some of the perhaps state or national conversation, but is also definitely upholding this message of uh, COVID is a real thing. Um, it's not a, a, you know, some kind of creation or fabrication. And it's something that we really do have to be careful about. So, and, and certainly this has been a huge drag on Hennepin County Hospital because that's where all the unemployed and, and people without a lot of means end up when they get sick from COVID. So how do you find that your, your resources as a as a hospital that is having enough beds, having enough staff, how is that able to keep up with this huge shift in demand or need for taking care of people? It seems to me that would be a huge challenge. It is a big challenge. And I think um, the whole healthcare system is under a lot of pressure. But as you described, so Hennepin County has one of the last remaining public hospitals. It's called Hennepin County Medical Center. And while technically the county doesn't own it, um, we are their, you know, like their rich grandparent, let's say. <laughs> um, we provide a lot of funding and a lot of support, and there's a huge amount of partnership. Um, increasingly, the conversation in the U.S. around healthcare is, is sort of um, expanding to understand things like housing as a component of health and well-being. And Hennepin County Medical Center has been a big partner for the county in that conversation as we work to provide social services to help people um, and support people in need. Uh, so the so HHS, the, the, the hospital that's here, uh, it is not just a Hennepin resource, but in fact has a reputation both uh, in, in Minnesota and also in the upper Midwest as a terrific place where, where people get excellent care, uh, where a lot of good research is going on. Um, and, and I don't think that the system has found, we have found the sort of silver bullet to make it all work. Um, I think that they're under an enormous pressure financially. Uh, they, like hospitals across the U.S., have sort of prepared for overflow capacity in our local um, convention center, for example. Uh, and there's more follow-up care happening where patient, patients are being sent home earlier, but then follow-up happens while the patient is at home instead of having that care that, you know, where you might stay in the hospital for an extra two, three days of the week. Um, the hospital, this hospital and many others are, are experimenting and finding great success with sending people home early, but then having medical care coverage come and visit somebody at home rather than that person taking up a bed in a hospital. Um, so there, there are all sorts of, you know, creative things going on, but I don't want to convey that the sort of the magic combination has been found because I do, I will tell you that the hospital is experiencing layoffs as we speak. Um, and it's a pretty tough situation because it is such an important community benefit. Well, and there's another side to, to Hennepin County too, is that it, as you said, it's a public hospital. 
And that kind of goes into this huge question that we have in America is healthcare for all and Medicare for all um, as compared to all the other private hospitals which are being run by very large and fairly wealthy healthcare systems. I mean, with the insurance people on the one side and the hospital on the other side. But we won't go into that tonight unless we have more time. There is a question about how counties collaborate with other counties. Um, you wanna have a comment about how you get along? Do you have sort of confabs where you all sit around and say, how are we gonna do this? Or you just send each other letters? We do, we do. There are two very active um, spaces in which I get to do that. One of them is the Minnesota Association of Counties, um, which has been terrific, especially during the pandemic. Um, we've um, sort of gotten together. We've agreed on um, certain things that the state government has allowed us to do in the pandemic that help us do our work better. Uh, and we are jointly pressuring the state government to let us do our work differently in those ways after the pandemic. A perfect example is that if you are somebody who needs um, financial support because you're, you know, you've hit, hit bottom, so to speak, and you're turning to the county for that, up to now, Hennepin County has been required to interview you in person. And so somebody who may be um, working, you know, several minimum wage jobs and is still looking for sort of that extra help has to take a day to come downtown or come to a county building somewhere and engage. And what we've found is um, in the pandemic, we've been given permission by the state of Minnesota to do that conversation over the internet, much like this phone call. Uh, and that has enabled us to more quickly help people who need help. And isn't that, of course, the objective? We're trying not to disrupt people's lives. We're trying to help people keep their lives on track the way that they need to or want to. Uh, so I've collaborated with other Minnesota counties to push the state to say, you know, we want to be able to do our business in, in this way even after the pandemic. So that's an example of Minnesota counties collaborating. Oftentimes that space can be a little complicated because we are this big sort of the elephant in the room. We're the gigantic urban county, very populated, you know, a, a, a really strong, diverse economy. And, and it's sort of us Ramsey County, which has St. Paul in it. And then there are two other counties that have Duluth and Rochester in them. And then after that, it's really pretty rural counties. So sometimes we can be an annoyance, but we really try to be a partner. <laughs> now on the national scale, um, there's a national association of counties where um, exactly as you described, like ideas are exchanged, best practices. And then even within that, there's an organization or a, or a, a, um, a table called the Large Urban County Caucus. And that's a space where I have found enormous value in conversation with other county commissioners because those commissioners are also in counties that are facing the same sort of demographic and economic pressures as Hennepin County is, uh, but they aren't in Minnesota, they're elsewhere. Um, so that's been a really a valuable space. We went, um, yeah. uh, just to give you a concrete example, Last year, I went to a Multnomah County, which is the county that has Portland, Oregon in it. And, and Multnomah and Hennepin have a lot of similarities. Uh, and especially this year with the civil unrest caused by the murder of George Floyd, uh, the counties have even more in common because there's been, they've both become sort of hotspots for demonstrations and pushback on the political status quo. Uh, so I was there last year studying something that they have started using called a race equity index. And it's a, a measure that um, they use across the county. It's sort of uh, spatial, geographic, um, and it, it, it uses a number of different measures to indicate the well-being of a community and where it makes sense to prioritize services or support or investment, um, whatever is needed in order to uh, build greater equity in the county. And that's the, that's the kind of work that's happening at Hennepin County in a different form, um, but it's really interesting to see what Multnomah is up to and see what we might learn. So the next question I wanted to ask, I was going to ask without getting into what has been popping up on chat. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the sort of contest of political opinions because of those people who come, um, of course, it's always tied to race, but you have those who, who don't want to wear masks because they think it's it's an invasion of their liberty. You have the people who own um, things in the city, and then there's the workers, and then you have this this large group of homeless and poor and otherwise 
disenfranchised. And I was just wondering, you know, before we talk about race, um, would you like to sort of talk about how that, and that kind of goes to the title of this whole study, which is doing democracy. How do you see that diversity and uh, public opinion and public the, the public sphere does solve its its questions in a democratic style, or do you find that probably it's all kind of useless and what we should do is have a, a fascist autocratic system and then everybody would just do what, what the commissioner tells them to do? I'm a big, huge believer in the, the democratic approach and the more that you can engage community, the better. Um, so a big push that we're undergoing here in Hennepin County is to have much more community engagement as we do every element of our work, you know, from putting in a sidewalk to um, planning a new building to providing a new service, how we want to do that as best as it can be. And I strongly believe that the way that that work can be done the best is by including the voices of the people who are going to be the most touched by the work. Um, the, there's a phrase that is sort of circulating in this in this vein called nothing about us without us. And I, I very much agree. I'm, I'm a big, huge believer in the, the democratic approach and the more that you can engage community, the better. Um, so a big push that we're undergoing here in Hennepin County is to have much more community engagement as we do every element of our work, you know, from putting in a sidewalk to um, planning a new building to providing a new service, how we want to do that as best as it can be. And I strongly believe that the way that that work can be done the best is by including the voices of the people who are going to be the most touched by the work. Um, the, there's a phrase that is sort of circulating in this in this vein called nothing about us without us. And I, I very much agree. You know, it can be a challenge because we also want to move forward and we don't want to necessarily, um, sometimes I feel a certain pressure not to wait for information that the community can offer. But we have to be very careful, I think, before moving without community input because it can be so valuable and there can be such sort of um, insightful ahas that are really driven by the voices of the people most affected by a decision. And there's no way in, in any individual's life experience, certainly not mine, that I can uh, really understand what every experience is like, but through imagination. It's, it's enormously helpful to have the voice of the community. But when the, the voice of the people in Minnesota means that marching on the highways and blocking the interstates you know, is not sanctioned by, you know, generally it's considered to be illegal to do that. And, you know, you obviously, you mentioned in a previous exchange how sometimes you have to drive around with a security patrol around you. So there is a kind of limit to free speech and free opinion that um, you have to deal with, I think. And I guess I'm asking whether, what is your secret to this? Is it that you just accept everything um, as long as you can, as long as you can, or do you feel that there needs to be a kind of process by which people's um, sort of separate opinions about things need to be processed and digested in the public space? Well, I think that government has to do a better job of serving everybody. And you know, I'll 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 own the fact that although county government is technically nonpartisan, I'm a Democrat. And I think that the Democrats historically have been more interested in helping everybody and raising all ships, you know, not believing in trickle down economics. But, but I will say that the, the Democratic Party, even when it's been in power, has not prevailed. And it feels, it feels that um, big change has not reached everybody. So when I see people demonstrating in the highways, as we have had here uh, in, on the interstate between Minneapolis and St. Paul a number of times in the last year, while I don't, you know, quote unquote, approve, I see it as a as a um, as a cry for help and a, an expression of enormous frustration that I think is very real. Um, I felt very in touch with this um, when George, after the murder of George Floyd, there was an immediate um, calling for the arrest and charging of the officers involved, and. 
I had a number of conversations with the county attorney at that time and asked, you know, why are you delaying? It's, you know, we've, we've got the film footage, the world has seen it, what are you waiting for? And the response was, you know, well, there's like process involved and think we have to sort of get these ducks in a row before we can issue the charges and so on and such forth. And at first, when I heard that, I felt like, oh, okay, you know, it's process and we need to, we need to wait for that. But then I thought, you know, no, wait a second. Like this system has not worked well, especially for communities of color. There's a sense of enormous unfairness you know, if, if it takes people like me calling out the system, even if I'm asking the system to do things that it's not designed to do, we have to call that stuff out in order to reach a, create a world, create an America that is fairer and where everybody really does have a shot at success and where people are treated fairly by the police. Um, so I think there is some balance to be found there. And, and I will say that um, uh, on earlier this fall, I had demonstrators in front of my house camping out uh, on the, the boulevard, which is sort of the piece of grass between the road and the sidewalk, right in front of my house. And, and I did feel that this sentiment was tested. Um, you know, I thought, do I, how do I feel about this? I believe in free speech and I believe that people are frustrated, but am I going to say, well, that's true, but you can't come to my front door. <laughs> um, this is another, there's another side to this is that a few years ago, there was Philander Castile that got shot um, in, in a suburb or a little town between Minneapolis and St. Paul. I forget whether that was in Ramsey County or Hennepin County. Um, and there were protests and everything, but the, none of that resulted in the property damage and what they call the violence that George Floyd and what, we, what was asked about Black Lives Matter. And now people are saying, well, you know, you, you, you should be able to protest, but if you go into violence, then your protest is invalid. It is discounted. If you can mm -hmm. protest without, you know, being a, you know, in the sense of a Gandhi approach where you can peacefully protest, that's great. But if you do something which is violent and if you burn down your neighborhood or other kinds of things, which seems so difficult for any of us who don't live there, um, that somehow invalidates what you are protesting about. Now, this is, I mean, this is not a question that you have to answer because I think you've done a, a great job and you don't really need to say much more about it. And if we had an open mic situation, we might all have a point of view about how does violence play into it, especially those of us who come out of India say, well, you know, we need to have Satyagraha and we're going to be very peaceful about all of this. And how can we do that? Um, so we need to, to sort of move on because we almost at the last 15 minutes of our discussion. Um, we will save personal questions for a minute. Um, okay, Joe, there's just yeah, one thing I sort of sure. want to chime in on, which is um, you brought up the, um, the sh how Philando Castile was shot. Um, we, you know, about every year, it is sort of the average, honestly, in Minnesota, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, a black, a, a black man is killed by the police, or, or maybe I should say a person is killed by the police in a situation that is um, questionable. Uh, and and here's the thing, like Hennepin County, like I want all of you to walk away with a sense of Hennepin County as a place that's really thriving. We have a very diverse economy. We've been able to sort of weather the, um, weather the pandemic better than some other regions as a result, uh, and even sort of other ups and downs in the economy. There's a lot going on here. It's a beautiful, a beautiful locale with, um, wonderful uh, outdoors. Um, there's an incredible sense of civic spirit, um, which is something that attracted me to live here um, when I moved here 20 years ago. But there is this Achilles heel that we have to address, which is that the disparities here by race are some of the worst in the nation. Um, and so when we talk, I think when the nation and the world talks about um, Black Lives Matter and, and that movement and that phrase and what that means, Hennepin County and Minnesota in general have enormous work to do. And so, and so there again, like I just can't help but um, have that sort of color how I respond to the frustration and, and, you know, why were there protests for George Floyd and not for Philando Castile? I think it's because people are saying, you know what, we're done. We're done waiting. We have to see this, this the change that we expect to see in government and in our society. 
Right. Excellent. Okay, we have to now get very personal and start asking you about your life. The last question that was put up on chat when I could still see it was, are you, are you um, like some of the other uh, bright stars in the American firmament thinking about running for Senate or even president at the near future? Or do you think you're going to think about this for a while? Um, you know, I'm very busy being a Hennepin County Commissioner, um, but I have learned never to say never. <laughs> I'll say oh, that. Listen to that. Um, that I don't, sounds like a very tricky I, I don't, answer. Um, yeah, I'm not trying to be coy. Um, I don't see a path um, or, you know, I don't see the timing being right for me. A lot of it is timing, but, but who knows, honestly. Excellent. All right. So now we're going to go back to Cody. What would be the single thing that you would remember physically or otherwise about Cody after it's been 35 years since you've been there more or less what do you remember from it oh it's I can't 35 years I will tell you that I've been I've been married for 12 years and for those 12 years I've been lobbying my husband who's now a retired English teacher to teach in Cody wouldn't that be amazing <laughs> um one of the things that I remember is Coker's walk so um, we would, our family would take walks along Coker's Walk, and I remember for whatever reason being very obsessed with turtles, and I would always pretend to be a turtle, uh, and I would run along the walk and sort of try to hitchhike, and there was that incredible view, you know, sort of rocks on one side and then just an expanse bigger than anything you've ever seen on the other, um, and, and that sense that Cody was at the top of the world. So if you could go and capture something from Cody that you could own it or buy it and keep it for yourself, what would that be? And my backyard would be full of eucalyptus trees. And what about Cody made you frightened? What did you remember as making you afraid? Oh, that's such an interesting question. I, nothing about Cody, just, you know, like I do remember I was, you know, um, five or six years old. I remember um, that my my class, for some reason, we used the upper school for part of our day, and I didn't know where the bathroom was, and I was terrified of the upperclassmen, so I didn't want to ask anybody where the bathroom was. You know, it, the, it, my fears were the fears of a five-year-old. <laughs> well, I mean, that that is actually a telling answer, because if you were, if you had lived in boarding, and we need to say that you didn't live in boarding, um, you probably would have been afraid of coming and being abandoned at boarding um, as one of your deepest fears, um, yeah. which, you know, we can talk about some other day. What is the biggest thing you remember about being in Cody? It's like physically biggest? Yeah, well, is there any other kind of big? <laughs> um, well, um, one thing that I, I don't... Um, I mean, again, the Yuki trees, like I okay, just remember being fine. teeny with these like enormous trees and the smell right. of them and the smell of them burning. Um, yeah. Okay. You've already brought your orange team cap from, from field day. Well, so, so I don't think to... everybody on this call saw it. Well, you could tell us again. This is from your first and only field day, right? This and is you... from field day, I believe. And it yeah. has a... Um, a medallion here, which somebody on this call told me is for the 75th anniversary. Of Cody School. Of Cody School, yes. Yeah, excellent. All right. What do you remember about food from India, if you can, at six years old? Well, I remember the curries and um, okay, eating off the banana leaf. Uh, another wonderful memory that I have that I definitely want to sort of get up front here is Miss Dennison, who was my teacher. Uh, and who I heard subsequently taught um, many of the folks here in the Twin Cities Cody Alumni Club. Um, but she was a wonderful woman who I was able to actually stay in touch with into my teens and high school and college years. Wow, well um, done. Yeah, I, I was wishing I could find for tonight a picture that I have of, of her, and I her and me together when I was about 19. Um, but she was a wonderful force. And I'm sorry, her picture wasn't in my class picture, I noticed. Hmm, excellent. Does anyone know what happened to Mrs. Dennison? I mean, she, she retired, retired in Pennsylvania. 
Oh, she retired okay. in Pennsylvania and she passed away a number of years ago. All right, thank you. What about animals? You, Do you remember animals in Cody? Oh my gosh, roly polies. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. My, my older brother, who I continue to look up to enormously, um, was very into like collecting insects and so on. And so I remember being in awe of his collection. Well, this is why you, we could have said you could have turned out to be this biologist, but then you just forsook it all for politics, for the human biology. Just a twist of fate. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we've got 10 minutes left. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and have open mic if we're careful, or you can still write your questions in the chat. Um, Manjusha said she might have some questions for us, but uh, we have a few minutes in case you get enthusiastic here. I have a question, Joe. Yeah. Um, Marion, thank you. It's really been wonderful. Um, you know, after George Floyd, everything sort of disappeared. So, you know, I mean, meaning we don't get a lot of news from Minnesota. What's mm -hmm. happened to the defund the police thing? I know that, yeah, it wasn't defunded, but there was all this stuff around it. What's happened yeah. around that? Well, I, you know, your question is such a great one and so well-timed because the, both the county and the city have been engaged in the throes of finalizing our budgets for next year. And a very big topic for Minneapolis has been you know, okay, so we're not defunding the police. So what are we gonna do that's different based on what we know? And uh, there, there's a big change in the city of Minneapolis with how they plan to respond to um, 911 calls that don't necessarily need police involvement. Um, so specifically, I think of like a mental health call that goes to through the 911 system. And often the first response is to send a police officer when really um, what they need is a mental health professional or a counselor. Um, so that's, that's sort of an example of the kind of work that the city council has tried to peel away from the police department and give more to social workers and whatnot. And it's actually in a space of interesting collaboration between the city and the county because the city does have their own police department, but the county tends to be the place where social work happens um, and, and the mental health crisis line is run by the county and so on. So it's a space where we've done a lot of uh, um, piloting and innovating. And I would say that the city of Minneapolis has come to us and said, okay, we want in on sort of all you're doing um, to make sure that they can de-escalate calls, you know, before they even send somebody out the door. So it's it, partly they need to train their cops in de-escalation techniques, but there are many calls that don't even need a police person. And right. those, those calls need to be triaged more intelligently. And they have um, the, the budget of the, uh, the city budget has um, been changed to reflect that. So it's, it's not as, um, as, as uh, thorough or you know as absolute as defunding the police, but there have been some big changes. Just like New York, great. I have a question. Please. Um, we live in Florida. This is Lloyd Dickerson, class of '55, by the way. Um, Welcome. We live in Florida, but we have a house still in Michigan too. And there seems to be a huge difference between the two states that I attribute to the governor in terms of um, the COVID um, responses. Mm. Um, Governor Whitmer in, in Michigan has been much more strict about businesses in, insisting on people wearing masks. Um, the, our governor down here is pretty lackadaisical. I think that's made a big difference. And I'm wondering about the uh, you know, the impression of her on how that is working. Yes, yeah, so thank you for asking about that. Our governor is sort of in the same sort of, you know, image of Governor Whitmer <laughs> um, and has been terrific at um, taking a sort of public health data-driven attitude. Uh, and he's also somebody who was elected by a pretty wide margin. He sort of straddled the middle. He's from a rural, he, he was a Congress, a member of Congress and he came from a relatively rural congressional district. So, so at least his original mandate, um, he sort of came in with as a very popular governor. The challenge for Minnesota has been that we are surrounded 
surrounded by states like Florida. <laughs> um, we were surrounded by the Dakotas that have been complete deniers, the state of mm -hmm. Iowa, the state of Wisconsin. Um, and with something, you know, in normal times, I feel like we're doing all right in spite of them because we have sort of our own economy and so on. But in, with something like a pandemic, the borders are just too porous. And unfortunately, we, I feel, are caught up in their bad decisions. Yeah, yeah thanks. Any uh, other? Yeah, questions? go ahead, Bob. I will, I will say on the topic of COVID and the governors, like the one thing that, that, um, that I do hear in conversation in the Twin Cities, and I suspect this conversation isn't necessarily happening elsewhere in the state, is there's this whole focus on reopening businesses. But shouldn't we shut all the businesses down so that kids can go to school? <laughs> like I, I, I do feel that there's been a sort of a communication of what our priorities are. And apparently our priorities are the bars and restaurants and not you know, whether or not a child gets to start reading by the age that they need to start reading. <laughs> money, money, go ahead, Bob. Uh, yeah, hi, Marianne. Thank you for uh, your, this presentation, which has been great. Um, I have a question. You mentioned that you <clears throat> moved to some other countries around the world after Cody. And I'm just curious, did you carry back with you uh, the same level of interest in those other places as you have with Cody? That's a great question and we'll sort of will reveal a few things. Um, I am also extremely close with my class from Islamabad, Pakistan. And I think there are a couple factors at play. One of them is that um, Facebook was invented and so we could reconnect. Um, I was just happened to be in a very close class in Islamabad. And so we are all, you know, as thick as thieves on social media in spite of the fact that we're sprinkled all over the world. Another factor that really has influenced my connection with Cody is um, when I first moved to the Twin Cities, as I mentioned 20 years ago, I, my parents visited and I took them to a South Indian restaurant because in my par family's currency, if your community has a South Indian restaurant, then your community is a community of, you know, of global scale. Um, and so we were enjoying dinner at a South Indian restaurant um, here in Minneapolis and the waiter came over and he said, you know, there's somebody at the other table who has bragged that they knew every American in India in the 70s. And so I would like to introduce him to you to see if he knows you. <laughs> um, and so a couple came over and that was uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kessler, who uh, had been the dorm parents at my brother's dormitory, you know, a lock end. <laughs> Uh, and so suddenly we were chatting with this family from Cody days and they told me about the alumni connection because I, I think that's um, especially active here in the Twin Cities because Cody was founded by Lutherans and there, you know, there are lots of Lutherans in Minnesota. So there's a, a sort of thing there. <laughs> um, and in any event, that sort of got me going and reconnected me with Cody that, um, that is different definitely from my classes uh, from Morocco or um, Brazil. Okay, Joe? it's time. No, Joe, wait, no, wait. time. We are following the rules here. It's nine o'clock. <laughs> we need to have Maureen, some time. Maureen, put it in the message. I'll message <laughs> yeah, you back. quick, write it okay. down. We want to thank Marion for taking your our questions and for sharing such great ideas with us. We want to thank Anjusha from Cody International School Alumni Office for doing so well in terms of promoting alumni relations on social media. This is great. This is something new. We want to congratulate you and thank you. We also want to recognize Paul's part of it because he runs his own parallel information system over there. We want to thank Sylvia for the Cody what is it? KFI, Cody Friends International Office. I'm getting old and tired. I don't apologize for being the one to actually technically host this and bring us all together and make it possible. We want to thank the board of KFI because we have two distinguished members or maybe more. Maureen is on the board of I'm back. I'm back now. You got okay, me now? Okay. Right. It, I get this weird thing. 
And we want to recognize Meg Green, who is also on the KFI board. Is there anyone else here from the board? Oh, Bill Martin, the former president of the board and member as well. Meg Green, we have to acknowledge as being the sister of our interviewee. It came up in, my in Marion's comments. Pardon? Yep. It's my claim to fame. I'm her sister. Excellent. Excellent. I know you have it. We won't comment. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I've already mentioned the people that joined us from abroad. We can mention them now for specifically because I think it's rather noteworthy. Gunhild is from Australia. Welcome, Catherine. K Kathy Scott, or now Catherine Koch, is from France, but she doesn't show her picture. Um, also in the class of 66. Oh, she's coming on. Welcome. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Good. Mary Lowry is on KFI board. This is a really padded audience. We have all these dignitaries listening and working with us. Anyone else who's on the KFI board that I haven't mentioned? Anyway, this is a chance. Wait, what am I getting more? To put a pitch in for supporting December is the time of giving, and this is a good chance for you to think of Cody School, Cody International School, as a recipient of your gifts and donations. I think we got a letter from President, uh, President, Principal Corey Sticksrude about supporting, so I'll put a plug in for that as well. I will put a plug in for our Minnesota chapter that Marion has been boosting as a Lutheran inside organization. It's not, <laughs> though I do admit, we do meet in a Lutheran church and I am a Lutheran. Um, and there's quite a few people who come to that, but- um, Well, Joe, here's my question. You said that you're a Lutheran. Is it, is the, how did you get connected to Cody? Is it because of your family's Lutheranism? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you said yeah. your brother lived on Lock End, and, and that was one of the three or four or five brands of Lutherans. Gunhild, for example, is Lutheran, but she's from Sweden Lutheran. And I am from the Missouri Synod Lutheran, and Bob is from the American Lutheran. And I'm actually, I'm actually not Lutheran, and I know that permission had to be gotten from all the parents. That Absolutely, my we live were very particular. Missouri Synod was very particular about diluting their their act of purity. Sylvia was part of that tribe as well. We have to be very careful about this. So, um, but I wanted to say is that we pride ourselves in Minnesota when we get together as the alumni. We do actually pitch our donations and contributions to Cody School. We're not very wealthy. We've only come up with a few hundred bucks, but I do think that it would be good if we remembered Cody International School in the month of December as a time for giving. So I'm not going to actually pass a hat because it's physically not possible, but I can do put my plug in. Okay, I'm done and I've run four minutes over. So now it's open, open, open mic because I have ended my work and Marion has ended her work. We will not um, take any honorariums, I will tell you. We will do this gratis as volunteers. Well, I just wanted to add my thanks to the list. It's, it's been such, it's been fun to engage to plan for this. And, you know, thank you for letting me talk about my work for an hour. That's always a joy. And um, the Cody connection is alive and kicking here in Minnesota. Very glad to be a part of this wonderful group and wonderful community. And I'm not on the board and I do ask you to support the school. Go Meg. 